Okay, real talk time. So this video was gonna be sponsored by EA, but due to their decision to aggressively pay gate essential features of the game, I made the decision to walk away from that sponsorship deal before it happened. It's my belief that spending money on a game means buying the whole game, and not having large chunks of it locked behind impossibly high play caps, all with the intent to get people to speed that process along by paying extra. As for why this episode is still happening, well, I just really like Star Wars, I think weather science is cool, it's something that we've never covered on the channel before, and honestly, I'd already put a lot of work into the script before the deal even began, so I didn't want all that to go to waste. That being said though, I want to make it perfectly clear up front. This video is not in any way supporting the pay systems that AAA game developers are currently implementing into their games. Alright? Alright, let's begin. <laughs> Internet, welcome to Game Theory, the show that every once in a while tries to expose a bit more of the business side of things. And since I'm briefly addressing my decision to walk away from that EA sponsorship at the top of this episode, let me also add this. Sponsorship deals tend to be made months in advance of a video going live, and once a contract is signed, you are locked in, and can incur tens of thousands of dollars in penalties if you start to back out. I was lucky in this case that I hadn't signed anything before policies around locked content in the game were decided, but I know other YouTubers who would have liked to have walked away from their commitments and just couldn't. Their contracts were already signed, so just be a bit more lenient on them when those sorts of videos come out. You know the phrase, don't hate the player, hate the game? Well, it's pretty darn accurate in cases like this. Of course, I know that obviously leads to the question of, well, why would you or anyone else support the game without knowing everything about it, and that's a fantastic question. The thing is, early releases of the game looked and played great. I had gotten to play through the multiplayer and the entirety of the single player game, and nothing essential about the game seemed locked in any of the playthroughs that any of us had been exposed to, and from what early players could tell, we were playing the game anyone who paid their $60 would also be playing. As you can see by how easily EA changed reward structures in response to the critical backlash, decisions around locked content are flexible, and happen much later. Even even days in advance of a game's release. Suffice it to say, uh, don't trust anyone? I guess? Never do a brand deal? I, I don't know. There's no real perfect solution. Moral of the story, I guess, is cut YouTubers a bit of slack in cases like this. Very few of them actively want to lie or promote garbage to you, and you can be sure they're feeling just as taken advantage of in situations like this as anyone else. Our businesses, and more importantly, our lives, are built on an established trust with you guys. And I don't think any YouTuber would be willing to put that at risk just so a company can sell a couple hundred more copies of their crappy video game. Anyway, hopefully that gives you a bit more perspective. Okay, enough business talk, let's hop into Star Wars. So, since none of you will play Battlefront 2, let me just tell you it starts off with the events you remember from Episode 6, Return of the Jedi, Death Star 2.0 blowing up, but this time, there's a twist. This time, you're soldiers for the Empire watching it all happen from the surface of Endor. It's actually a really cool moment, looking at it through the eyes of a soldier who doesn't realize they're fighting for the evil side. It was the first time I actually stopped to think about how many people were on board the Death Star and how sobering it would be to watch all of your co-workers get wiped out in an instant. Anyway, from there, Battlefield 2's campaign focuses on the aftermath of the Emperor's death. And if there's one thing that you can say about our good old pal Sheev... Wait, wait, really? Emperor Palpatine's first name is Sheev? Hold up, let me double check this. Darth Plagueis, Darth Sidious, Emperor... Uh... Anakin. You are the chosen one. I have the high ground now. Ha, ah, yeah, here we go. Sheev. Sheev Palpatine. <laughs> well, that name must have fallen out of favor. Anyway, Sheev Palpatine was not the type of guy to take death lying down. He left behind messenger drones that deliver his dying wish to enact Operation Cinder, a final plan to crush the rebellion with really bad weather. Hey, when your planet destroying laser goes busts, you gotta have a backup plan of some type. We find out that Operation Cinder, for some reason always written as Operation Colon Cinder, consists of encircling planets with experimental satellites that form a climate disruption array. We first see it used on the main character's home planet Vardos and later Naboo, where lasers touch down and start creating unnatural storms. This storm is unnatural. Thanks, Del. Thanks for that crack observation. In the canon Star Wars Aftermath series of novels, we actually find out that Operation Colon 
Cinder causes electrical storms that ravage entire planets, causing dozens of hurricanes, fires, and flooding. And that's a science we haven't covered yet here on Game Theory. Weather control. Is it really possible? And if you did want to completely wreck a planet like this, how exactly would a climate disruption array actually work? Well, the idea of shooting lasers from space to ruin a planet's climate might seem a bit ridiculous. As it turns out, weather modification is a very real field of scientific study. In fact, the idea of weaponizing weather for destructive purposes is a big enough concern that the United Nations has banned weather modification in warfare. There's a mind blow for you. It's enough of a possibility that governments have banned it. Well, there goes my idea of solving tensions in the Middle East by sending a 30% chance of light rain showers. That being said, most research into weather modification has been into using it for good, like increasing rainfall for areas that need the water or reducing the severity of hurricanes. And it's by looking at these hurricane relief techniques that we're able to get a better idea of how we might artificially create storms similar to the ones that we see up here on the planet Bardos. Hurricanes are fueled by evaporation and water vapor, which is why they're so common in the ocean near the equator during the summer months. That means, though, that if you can prevent evaporation, you could theoretically prevent a hurricane, with some researchers looking at the possibility of applying a film layer to oceans to prevent the water from evaporating. And I am sure that absolutely no unintended consequences would come from preventing the freaking water cycle from happening. Come on, humanity! Do I need to talk about invasion? species again. But if our goal is to cause hurricanes with the flash of a laser, we need to actually do the opposite. Produce more vapor. Going back to the game, every time we see the climate disruption array in effect, it's a collection of satellites shooting lasers down to the planet. And this absolutely makes sense. Lasers allow you to easily control the direction of light, which in turn increases the temperature of whatever they're hitting. Aim a few lasers at the same body of water and you'll get the temperature to rise and start the evaporation you need to promote the conditions for a hurricane to form. But there's one huge problem with relying on storms as your primary form of destruction. Hurricane are fueled by water vapor and can only continue to wreak havoc as long as they continue to absorb more of that water vapor. Coastal towns, sure, they're gonna get decimated, but if you're in a landlocked city far away from the nearest ocean, you're gonna be relatively safe. Any hurricane headed your way would run out of water long before it actually reached you. But according to the Shattered Empire comic series, Operation Colon Cinder renders Naboo inhospitable in just a few hours. And the urgency that the Battlefront campaign has when trying to rescue the people of Vardos indicates that our main character only has a limited amount of time to get people off the planet. She's acting like she has hours, and not days, to get people to safety. Massive hurricanes along the coastlines wouldn't render an entire planet inhospitable in a matter of hours, which means that something else is at work here. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on which side you're on, Operation Colon Cinder does more than just cause storms. You see, while Battlefront's campaign and the Shattered Empire comics do show the destructive weather caused by the climate disruption array, what they fail to show is something far more dire. The most catastrophic part of Operation Cinder, the destruction of the atmosphere itself. Just so we're on the same page, an atmosphere is a layer of gases surrounding a planet held in place by gravity. On planets like Earth, and presumably planets that sustain life in the Star Wars series, the atmosphere allows organisms to survive by serving as a defense layer against incoming light. For example, on Earth, the atmosphere blocks a lot of the radiation that's getting sent to us by the sun, thus allowing people to enjoy a sunny day without turning into Octomom. But lasers aren't sunlight. In fact, they're not even close. Unlike sunlight, which comes from a star that's millions of miles away and enters the atmosphere in a diffuse form, the entire point of a laser is to shoot a concentrated beam of energy super long distances. When sunlight shines, on a planet, it's spread out over a large area. But when a climate disruption laser hits the atmosphere, it's hitting a small number of air molecules at a very high energy. And something happens when those air molecules absorb a lot of that energy. They become plasma. Plasma, in case you've forgotten your middle school science class or my Dragon Ball Z episode, is the fourth state of matter after solid, liquid, and gas. The sun is plasma, lightning is plasma, and now, thanks to the climate disruption laser shooting off from a couple hundred miles above your planet, the sky turns plasma. But what does that exactly mean? Well, let me explain. Lightning is a momentary discharge that lasts only a fraction of a second. One twenty thousandth of a second, to be exact. But if you had a concentrated laser, scratch that, 20 concentrated lasers all focused on the atmosphere, they would continuously create the conditions needed to turn the air into plasma. 
So that begs the question, what would that look like? Well, imagine if the atmosphere above you, all the air around you caught fire. Except the air in the sky doesn't combust, so technically it's not burning. Instead, it undergoes a process called ionization, where it gets so super energized, it converts to plasma. It's not on fire, it becomes fire. And when I say fire, I am talking about way hotter than normal fire. Most fire we see comes from burning materials that combust at relatively low temperatures. A wooden campfire burns at a temperature of around 500 degrees Fahrenheit, but the air ionized by the space lasers would become plasma at a temperature at around 310,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 172,204 degrees Celsius, more than 600 times hotter than the campfire, and 30 times hotter than the burning point of any material known on Earth. More than twice the temperature of the sun. Forget red hot or even white hot, the ionized air would have such a high energy level that it would appear purple, the highest energy color on the energy spectrum. Considering that Emperor Palpatine was a man who was famous for shooting purple lightning out of his hands, it seems fitting that his plans for Naboo would involve bathing the planet's atmosphere in super hot purple plasma. Ooh, that purple color is so on brand, Emperor Palpatine. At this point, assuming the satellites sustain concentrated laser fire on the same point on the planet, they'll keep increasing the temperature of the ionized air around it, and heat doesn't stay in one place it spreads. Just like a space heater sitting in the corners enough to keep an entire room toasty warm, one laser created ionization point in the planet's atmosphere would begin heating up the entire planet. As the heat spreads from the epicenter of the laser's focus, more and more of the surrounding air would be heated beyond its ionization point, creating even more plasma. What might first appear as a single purple dot on the horizon would quickly expand outward, a ball of energy growing in size as it spreads spread through the air in all directions, both across, affecting the air around it, and downward, affecting the air below it, eventually reaching the planet's surface. A 310,000 degree Fahrenheit ball of plasma hitting you in the face! Now, obviously, coming into contact with 310,000 degree Fahrenheit plasma would instantly burn you to death. But don't worry, you'd die a far more horrific and unsettling death long before the plasma ever touches you. Air doesn't have to reach its 310,000 degree Fahrenheit ionization point to burn you to death. Not even close. Your flesh, along with everything else around you, would be burning at only 1% of that temperature. As you stare up at the sky, watching the glowing plasma envelop the planet's atmosphere, you'd slowly start to feel the air around you heating up, a warm glow from the plasma heating the air hundreds of miles away, a warmth that would gradually grow hotter and hotter until you found yourself boiling alive, literally being baked to death like you were inside the world's largest convection oven. Because that's actually where you would be. One minute you'd be living your normal life, the next, you'd be trapped by the incredibly hot air cooking you. Nothing would look different. Nothing would change. It'd just be you with absolutely nowhere to run to escape the rising heat. By the time the all-enveloping plasma touched your part of the planet, you'd already have been burned to death. And that is the real terror of Operation Cinder, which, I gotta say, more than lives up to its name. If only they'd put that scene into the game. Or... Maybe they have, and you just gotta pay to unlock it. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. These are not the droids you're looking for. This is the subscribe button you were looking for. You'll want to make sure you're up to date on all the latest theories about the universe. So click it. It's not a trap.